section forty two of monday tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org monday tales by alphonse daudet translated by marion mcintyre section forty two the blind emperor or a journey in bavaria in search of a japanese tragedy part one colonel von seibolt in the spring of eighteen sixty six colonel seibolt a bavarian in the service of holland well known in the scientific world through his charming works upon the japanese flora came to paris to submit to the emperor a vast project for an international association for the exploitation of that marvellous nippon japon japon land of the rising sun where he had resided for thirty years while awaiting an audience in the tuileries the illustrious traveller who had remained decidedly bavarian in spite of his sojourn in japan passed his evenings in a little beer-shop of the faubourg poissonniere in company with a young lady of munich who travelled with him and whom he introduced as his niece there it was i first ran across him the physiognomy of this tall old man erect and sturdy in spite of his sixty-two years his long white beard his interminable fur-lined coat its buttonhole decked with ribbons of various colours presented by divers academies of science his foreign manner in which there were at once timidity and boldness his whole appearance was sufficient to cause all eyes to turn in his direction whenever he entered the colonel would seat himself solemnly and draw from his pocket a big black radish then the little lady who accompanied him decidedly german in the cut of her short skirt her fringe shawl and her little tourist hat would proceed to cut that radish in thin slices after the fashion of her country cover it with salt and offer it to her oncle as she called him in her thin voice as small as a mouse's and both of them would begin to nibble sitting vis-a-vis -vis, tranquilly and with perfect simplicity without the slightest suspicion that to behave in paris exactly as if in munich might cause ridicule truly this was an original and sympathetic couple and it did not take long for us to become great friends the worthy man perceiving how well inclined i was to listen when he talked of japan asked me to revise his memoir and i hastened to accept the task prompted as much by regard for this aged sinbad as by the desire to plunge more deeply into the study of that beautiful country for which he had communicated his own love to me this labour of revision was by no means a light one the entire memoir was written in the same bizarre french that colonel seibolt spoke si je vrai des actionnaires si je réunirai des fonds and those blunders of pronunciation which made him say regularly les grandes boîtes de la scie for les grands poètes de l'asie and le chabon for le japon add to this many of his phrases were fifty lines in length without a period a single comma nowhere a breathing place and yet the whole so well arranged in the brain of the author that to omit a single word seemed to him impossible if it occurred to me to cut out a line he very quickly transferred it to another place notwithstanding this terrible man was so interesting with his chabon that i forgot to be tired while i laboured and when the letter arrived granting an audience the memoir was already fairly well in shape poor old seabolt i can still see him walking towards the tuileries all his crosses upon his breast in his uniform with that fine colonel's coat of scarlet and gold which he brought from his trunk only upon great occasions in spite of his oft-repeated brum brum as he straightened his tall figure again and again as i felt his arm tremble against mine and noted the unusual pallor of his nose the fine big nose of a scientist crimsoned by study and the beer of munich 
i knew that he was deeply moved that evening when i saw him again he was triumphant napoleon the third had received him between two doors listened for five minutes and dismissed him with that favourite phrase i will see i will consider as a result of which the naive japanese was already talking of renting the first story of the grand hotel writing to the journals and issuing a prospectus i had great difficulty in making him understand that his majesty's reflections might require some time and that meanwhile it would be better to return to munich where parliament had just voted funds for the purchase of his great collection my remarks finally convinced him and on his departure he promised me in return for the trouble i had taken with his famous memoir a japanese tragedy of the sixteenth century entitled the blind emperor a precious masterpiece absolutely unknown in europe and translated by him expressly for his friend meyerbeer the master was about to write the music for the choruses at the time of his death you perceive that the gift the good man wished to make me was a valuable one unfortunately some days after his departure war broke out in germany and i heard nothing more of my tragedy the prussians having invaded Württemberg and bavaria it was quite natural in his patriotic excitement and the confusion attending an invasion that the colonel should have forgotten my blind emperor but i thought of it myself more than ever and i confess partly stirred by a longing for my japanese tragedy partly moved by curiosity to see what war and invasion at close range were like o oh, ye gods how the horror of it all remains in my memory i decided one fine morning to set out for munich part two south germany talk of your phlegmatic nations in the midst of war and burning beneath that intense august sun all the country beyond the rhine from the bridge of kell to munich itself how tranquil and cold it all seemed through the thirty windows of the Württemberg car which took me slowly sluggishly across swabia landscape after landscape was unrolled mountains ravines masses of rich verdure which suggested the presence of refreshing streams upon many a slope which would disappear as the train moving on passed through some wind of the road peasant girls were seen standing stiffly in the midst of their cattle clad in red petticoats and velvet bodices and the trees around them were so green that one might almost fancy he saw a miniature landscape taken from one of those tiny fir boxes fragrant with the resinous odours of northern forests now and then we would see a dozen foot soldiers clad in green covering steppe in a meadow heads erect legs raised bearing their guns as if they were crossbows perhaps the army of some nassau prince sometimes other trains passed as slowly as our own loaded with big boats where the Württemberg soldiery huddled as if in some allegoric chariot sang three-part barcarolles as they fled before the prussians there were halts at every refreshment station and one saw major-domos with rigid smiles and those fat good-natured faces napkins tucked under their chins standing before enormous hunches of meat served with sweetmeats then came the royal park of stuttgart full of coaches toilets cavalcades waltz music playing about the fountains quadrilles while a battle was in progress at kissingen really when i recall all this and think of what i saw four years later in that same month of august locomotives madly rushing no one knew where as if the great sun itself had bewitched their boilers railroad cars pulling up on the very battlefield rails cut trains in distress france reduced day by day as the eastern line grew shorter and shorter all along the route abandoned tracks and a dismal assemblage of railway stations which were left in their loneliness in a deserted land full of wounded men forgotten like so much luggage i begin to believe that the war between prussia and the southern states was but a sham war after all and that in spite of all which could be told us the german wolves do not devour each other 
to see munich was to be convinced of this the evening when i arrived a beautiful sunday evening the sky thick with stars all the city was out of doors a vague joyous rumour was floating in the air as indistinct beneath the light as dust raised by the footsteps of all these promenaders in the cool vaulted beer cellars in the beer gardens where coloured lanterns swayed to and fro with a dim light everywhere was heard mingling with the noise of the covers of beer mugs dropping heavily the sound of brass and wood instruments uttering triumphal notes it was in one of these harmonic beer shops i discovered colonel seabolt seated with his niece before that everlasting black radish of his at a side table the minister of foreign affairs was drinking bock in company with the king's uncle all around us were seated the worthy citizens of munich with their families officers in spectacles students wearing little caps red blue and sea green all were grave and silent and listened religiously to herr gungel's orchestra as they watched the clouds of smoke rising from their pipes with no more concern about prussia than if it did not exist the colonel seemed slightly disturbed when he saw me and i believe that he lowered his voice perceptibly when he addressed me in french around us were whispers of franzos franzos and i could feel the ill-will every glance conveyed let us go said colonel c bolt and once we were outside his smile was as frank as of old the worthy man had not forgotten his promise but he had been very much absorbed in the arrangement of his japanese collection which he had sold to the state that was the reason why he had not written as for my tragedy it was at wurzburg in the hands of frau von Siebold, and to reach that place it was necessary to obtain a special permission from the french embassy for the prussians were approaching wurzburg and it was now very difficult to gain entry but i had so strong a desire to obtain my blind emperor that i would have gone to the embassy that very evening had i not feared that m de trevise would have gone to bed part three in adrosky early the following morning the landlord of the grap bleu persuaded me to climb to the top of one of those small conveyances which stand in hotel courtyards and can always be hired by travellers who wish to be shown the curiosities of the city from which equipage monuments and avenues appear exactly as if you had encountered them upon the pages of a guide-book on this occasion the city was not to be shown to me but i was to be conducted to the french embassy Franzositka ambassade the hotel keeper repeated twice the coachman a little man in blue livery a gigantic hat upon his head seemed much astonished at the new destination of his fiacre or his droschken as they call it in munich but i was even more astounded than he when i saw him turn his back upon the noble quarter where we were and enter a poorer part of the city which for a long distance was lined with factories working men's lodgings and tiny gardens then he passed beyond the gates and out of the city ambassade francesica i asked uneasily from time to time ja ja answered the little man and we rolled on and on i would have gladly received further information but what the deuce was to be done my guide could not speak french and i myself at this epoch knew only two or three phrases of the german language very elementary ones at that which related merely to bread bed meat and had naught to do with such words as ambassador and even these few words i could only deliver set to music and this is the reason some years before with a comrade almost as mad as myself i had travelled across alsace switzerland and the duchy of baden a real colporteur's journey knapsacks strapped upon our shoulders striding across the country a dozen leagues at a stretch turning aside from the cities of which we wished to see nothing more than the gates following each tiny byway never knowing whither it would lead us often the result would be that we had to pass a night unexpectedly in the open field or in some barn whose roof was the sky but what made our journey still more eventful was the fact that neither of us knew a single word of german 
by the aid of a little pocket dictionary purchased as we were passing through basel we had been able to construct a few extremely simple phrases quite naive in character such as wir wollen trinken beer we want beer to drink wir wollen essen kasse we want some cheese to eat unfortunately though they may not seem at all complex to you it cost us much labour to retain these accursed phrases we did not in the comedian's language have them at our tongue's end then it occurred to us that we would set them to music and the little air we had composed was so well adapted to the purpose that the words entered our heads along with the notes and it was impossible to utter these phrases without dragging along the music it was indeed a sight to see the expression on the face of the baden innkeepers when of an evening we would enter the great hall of the gast house and immediately our knapsacks were unbuckled chant in resonant voices wir wollen trinken beer repeat wir wollen ja wir wollen ja wir wollen trinken beer since that time i have become most proficient in german i have had so many opportunities to learn the language my vocabulary has been enriched by a host of expressions and phrases but i say them i sing them no longer ah no i have not the least wish to sing them but to return to my droschken we went at a slow trot down an avenue bordered with trees and white houses suddenly the coachman paused da he said pointing out to me a little white house hidden among the acacias which seemed to me somewhat secluded and quiet for an embassy three copper knobs one above the other gleamed in a corner of the wall beside the door i pulled the first one i chanced to touch the door opened and i entered an elegant and comfortable vestibule flowers and carpets everywhere on the staircase half a dozen bavarian chambermaids came running to answer my ring standing in line with that awkward appearance of birds without wings that characterizes all the women beyond the rhine i inquired ambassade franzosica they made me repeat this twice and then began to laugh so loudly that they shook the banister i returned to my coachman furious and endeavoured to make him understand with an abundance of gestures that he was mistaken and the embassy was not there ja ja responded the little man without the slightest show of emotion and we returned toward munich i must believe that our ambassador then at munich changed his domicile very frequently or else my coachman unwilling to depart from custom with regard to his droschken was determined i should see if possible the city and its environs at all events our entire morning was passed in driving over munich in every direction in search of that fantastic embassy after two or three attempts i ended by refusing to descend from the carriage the coachman went in search returned stopped in certain streets and appeared to ask information i allowed myself to be driven on no longer occupied except in looking about me what a wearisome cold city this munich with its great avenues its rows of palaces its oversized streets where every footstep resounds its open-air museum of bavarian celebrities who seem so very dead as one glances at their effigies in white marble what colonnades arcades frescoes obelisks greek temples propylia with dip distiches in golden letters upon their frontons so much effort at grandeur but one cannot help feeling the emptiness and pomposity of it all finding at the end of each avenue a triumphal arch where the horizon alone passes and porticoes open to the blue sky so i picture to myself those imaginary cities italy mingling with germany where musset parades the incurable ennui of his fantasio and the solemn stupid bewigged head of the prince of mantua this drive in the droschken lasted five or six hours at the end of which time the coachman brought me back triumphantly to the courtyard of the grappa bleu cracking his whip quite proud to have shown me munich as for the embassy i finally found it two streets from my hotel but it did me little good for the chancellor was unwilling to give me a passport for wurzburg 
it seems that we were not very favorably regarded in bavaria at this time it would have been dangerous for a frenchman to venture beyond the outposts i was consequently obliged to wait in munich until frau von Siebold should find occasion to send me the japanese tragedy End of section forty two